Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and Distinguished Members of Congress. I'm the Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. I've also served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General, an Assistant United States Attorney, an Associate Independent Counsel, and as a Criminal Defense Attorney. Special Counsel Mueller deserves a lot of credit for conducting a thorough investigation. While Volume 1 of his report chronicles, chronicles in detail how the Russians attempted to interfere in our election, and concludes that no one in the Trump campaign was involved in that unlawful effort, I am less enthusiastic about volume two. Under the applicable regulations, it was the special counsel's duty to provide the attorney general with a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions reached by him. By not making a traditional prosecutorial judgment with respect to the obstruction of justice allegations, Mr. Mueller failed to fulfill that duty. While governing OLC opinions provide that a sitting president cannot be indicted, there was nothing to preclude the special counsel from stating that the evidence would be sufficient to convict the president of obstruction of justice if that's what he believed. By not doing so, the special counsel put the attorney general in the difficult situation of having to make that decision. Here, General Barr's determination that the evidence is insufficient to establish that the president attempted to obstruct justice is eminently reasonable. While it is possible for someone to obstruct justice who did not commit the offense that is under investigation, it is extremely rare. In the overwhelming majority of cases, individuals who attempt to obstruct justice do so because they know darn well that they committed a crime and fear that the investigation will uncover that fact. Moreover, it is almost invariably the case that someone attempting to obstruct an investigation also engages in other nefarious activities, such as destroying evidence, suborning perjury, bribing witnesses, or threatening them with bodily harm. Here, the president provided over a million pages of documents, allowed key members of his staff to be interviewed, and submitted written questions or answers to questions. These are not the actions of someone attempting to obstruct an ongoing investigation despite being clearly maddened by its existence. In obstruction of justice cases, the most difficult thing to establish is that the accused acted Go get it. a corrupt Go get intent. It. That is, for an illegitimate purpose. When someone destroys evidence or threatens witnesses, this task is relatively straightforward. Not Go so get it. here. The president had legit perfectly legitimate reasons to be exasperated by the cloud hanging over his presidency from this investigation and for wishing it to come to a speedy conclusion. The investigation caused some to question the legitimacy of his election because the allegations involve claims that high-level people in his campaign engaged in a conspiracy with Russia to steal the election. The president repeatedly expressed concerns that the investigation was hampering his ability to govern and to engage in foreign relations, especially with Russia. President Trump might well have concluded that the investigation should be cur curtailed or even terminated because it was impeding his ability to do the job that the American people elected him to do. Such an alternative non-corrupt motive, other than naked self-interest, might also explain his conduct. Further, adopting Mueller's legal theory could have a chilling effect on a president who might well hesitate before engaging in some controversial action such as removing an official, signing an executive order, or issuing a pardon, out of fear that his subjective intent might be questioned at some point in the future by a prosecutor, perhaps a politically motivated one, undertaking a criminal investigation. For this reason, the law requires that Congress issue a clear statement before a generally worded statute, such as the one that Mr. Mueller relied upon, can be applied to the president. No such clear statement exists here. To be sure, OLC has stated that some statutes, such as the bribery statute, can be applied to the president. However, while it is easy to disentangle facially criminal acts, such as paying a bribe or threatening a witness, from legitimate exercises of presidential authority, the same cannot be said of many of the acts that were investigated by the special counsel, such as criticizing the fairness of the I'll investigation, be in about, about in asking minute. subordinates to publicly defend him, removing an official, or contemplating issuing a pardon each of which may have been undertaken for a mixed motive or an entirely pure one. Deciding which is which would inevitably interfere with the president's ability to serve the nation as he sees fit in the exercise of his Article II powers, thereby raising profound separation of powers issues. While it is certainly true that no man, including the president of the United States, is above the law, it is equally true 
that the president occupies a unique position in our constitutional structure and that some laws apply differently to him and some don't apply at all, at least when there has been no clear statement by Congress that the law should apply to him or when doing so might impinge upon the exercise of his constitutional prerogatives. I thank you for inviting me here to testify today and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Professor McQuaid.